Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net and welcome to another comic art tutorial. In this video, we're going to be working on Goliath. Once again, you can see that so far we've added in his major outline. We've also dropped in the core shadows and now we have some idea as to what the lighting scheme is going to be that we're placing this character under. And that's really going to determine later on how we add in the rendering and where we add it in order to pump up the level of definition and three-dimensionality throughout this character, which is really the aim of the game when it comes to comic book art. Since we are working on a two-dimensional flat surface, we want to get our characters to pop as much as possible. We want them leaping off the page. And so in order to do that, we've got to be very, very good at creating the illusion of depth. And one of the ways at which I'm doing that right now, in fact, is I'm suggesting Goliath's material, what his skin is going to be made of with these little textured details that are represented as very fine-lined, subtly weighted contours that are wrapping around each one of those major muscle groups. When I say that they're wrapping around them, I really want to emphasize that point. It's not that I'm laying these contour lines in straight. No, that wouldn't get the, the three-dimensional illusion across very well. We want to describe the surface of each one of these muscles, the roundness of them, the bulginess of those muscles by having those cross contours, which is what essentially these lines are that are laying in to indicate that rock stone like texture we want to have them wrap around the surface of those forms and what that does is it just helps the viewer to perceive what we're showing them as having depth as having the those three-dimensional qualities that is the major goal here and we always want to have that at the forefront of our mind as a top priority because everything that we're going to add in here from this point onward is to enhance that depth starting with the rendering i guess we started with the textures and materials didn't we so we're kind of moving on to the rendering now just to push that depth that little bit further and I'm going to start out the rendering process with an initial layer of hatching. And later on, we will proceed on to the cross hatching, which is just another layer on top of these hatches that'll help us to push the amount of contrast and value that we're able to create within the tones that these hatches are coming together to suggest. And that's really what we're trying to create here by laying in these hatches. You'll notice that even though they are individual, uniform, parallel lines, that they all come together, and if you want to squint your eyes to check this, they all come together to create a mid-tone or a gradient tone that helps us to blend the pure black values, the shadows, into the pure white values on the lighter side of the form. And this, in turn, allows us to describe to a greater extent the way in which these forms are being lit. It also helps to show the roundness of those forms once more. We are pulling these hatches out from the shadows along the form, and you'll notice that they're curving around its surface as they protrude out of those, those darker areas and into the highlights. Now, in order to control the way in which the gradient appears to us on the page through these hatches is we're able to tweak their characteristics a little bit. And they have three primary characteristics that we're able to modify, and that is their length, their thickness, and the distance at which they sit from one another. And by maneuvering and tweaking and and playing around with these different variables, we are able to achieve a variety of effects. And it really does depend 
on the role that they're going to serve throughout the character and how we want them to come across in certain portions of their design. Now, in this particular instance, we are shading the anatomy of Goliath primarily. We're trying to get the form of his muscle to really pop a little. And all that this is, is really just the art of lighting them effectively. You know, without light, we have no shading. And without shading, we have no way to be able to describe the three-dimensional aspects of the forms that we're dealing with. We can't actually indicate or see their surface characteristics. So we're just lighting the forms here. And so in saying that, we've got to make sure that we are always keeping inside the back of our mind where the primary light source is inside the scene and from what direction it is projecting down onto the character from. In this case, it is the top left. And the good thing about already having those core shadows implemented into the character is that we already have a good visual indication as to what the lighting setup is going to be, where we need to place a majority of the hatching which is going to occur throughout Goliath's design. And that's kind of why I place those core shadows in first. Now I just want to take your attention here to the chest plate that I've added on to Goliath's right peck. And the reason as to why I want to draw your attention to this area at this point is because you'll notice that I'm shading it in a slightly different way to the way in which I've been shading the rest of his body. Because here we are dealing with a form that is made up of hard surfaced planes, which means each one of the geometrical surface planes that this chest plate consists of will be shaded uh, to a, a varying level of tone. And that means that on the dark side of that chest plate, we're going to see the planes that it consists of as having much more densely packed, thicker hatches implemented into it. But then as the form is transitioned into those lighter tones where the light is hitting it at its highest intensity, you'll notice the planes on that side of the chest plate asset are in fact presented with very little hatching at all. In fact, the only hatching that we see is a few little nicks of detail that help to describe less how the chest plate is shaded and more the material and textual qualities that it's made of. But now we're moving back to Goliath's body and we're starting to shade the midsection of his anatomy, which is... You know, again, if you look at the way in which we shaded that chest plate in comparison to the way we are now shading his ribs and his later his abdominal region, well, we're looking at much softer forms here that are a little bit more rounded. There is a more gradual blend between the pure blacks and the pure whites. And so what is the point that I'm trying to make here. Well, the point is that every form is going to have a number of different characteristics that you want to have come across visually if you want your audience to interpret the character design you're illustrating in the way you've meant for it to be interpreted. And these characteristics can consist of the surface that you're dealing with, you, again, most forms can be broken up into two primary surfaces. You've got kind of organic, soft, rounded surfaces. You can think of them very simply as spherical. And then you've got these more blockier, hard surfaced forms, which in simple terms is, is kind of a cube, right? Or a rectangular prism. And they're angular. And the way in which they're shaded is a little more distinct in terms of the, the planes that are going to have those hatches placed in around them and the way in which they're split up using the values that those hatches create. 
So you've got very distinct transitions between the tones on those hard surfaced forms. But then when it comes to the softer forms, like the muscles that we're dealing with throughout the majority of Goliath's body, well, now the transitions between light and dark become more gradual. You can see here, especially with his bicep and his forearm muscles, that as we pull those hatches out from the shadows, we spread them further and further apart and add less thickness to them until they become so subtle that they almost disappear into the lighter portions of that form. And that's the exact effect that we want to go for, a very soft, very subtle transition between those two major light and dark values. Again, this doesn't just help us to light the character and give him that additional level of three-dimensionality, but it also helps to describe the forms of these different parts throughout his design. And this is super important. This is something that I'm always trying to do, and one of the reasons as to why I take the time to go through this cross-hatching process each and every illustration I create, because I know that it's going to be able to allow me to push the amount of depth within all of my artwork. And it does require more commitment, more energy, more time sitting at the drawing table. And with that said, it is a personal preference. Not everybody is going to be willing to sit there for that long, or will they have the time to commit to such a long and drawn out ordeal? And when I say ordeal, it makes it sound bad, but it's actually not. For me, it's fun because as you're laying in those hatches, you are constantly challenged. Why? Because you're always thinking about what areas do these hatches need to be placed in order to get the form to read correctly. It's a balancing act. It truly, truly is, because one of the things that most comic book artists run into, one of the major dilemmas, is that they end up falling into the trap, and this is including myself, of over-rendering their comic book artwork. And it's all too easy to do. Why? Because they just don't get the scale of light to dark across the character in its entirety correct. We need to remember that even though we are shading individual forms here, we're placing those hatches in around the biceps, the deltoids, the pecs, the abs, the forearms, and later the legs, and around all those intricate mechanical assets that uh, we've also added into Goliath's design. But yet at the same time, we need to consider the fact that as the major light source projects down upon the character and casts across them, that at the top of Goliath, we're going to see lighter tones, lighter values, more so than at the bottom. Because essentially, that fall-off is going to cause the bottom half of Goliath's body to be slightly darker. Now, of course, it depends on the characteristics of the light as well. What direction it's coming from, how bright it is, what time of day the light source is going to be kind of, I guess, co conveying. Uh, whether or not it is a natural light in the first place, whether it's an artificial light, all of these things will kind of help you to determine exactly how the shadows should be placed in around the character and thus the rendering. But it's important to keep in mind that there will always be more rendering required and more shadows implemented into the character within the darker portions of their body which overall is created through the fall off of light along its entire length. So this is a little bit hard to describe and probably a little bit hard to get. A lot of people end up kind of completely missing this and what ultimately results within their artwork is a character that 
is shaded very, very well. All the subforms are perfectly cross-hatched. It looks good, close up at least, but then when they zoom out, overall the way in which that character is shaded just doesn't make sense. It doesn't convey the light source the character is being lit under correctly. In fact, it looks like there's a light source on every single one of those subforms, on every single muscle or every single portion of their design. When really, in reality, it's one light source casting across the entire character. And so there is a scale of light and dark that I'm shading my character to as I work. And I know that there is going to be more hatching required around his legs here. And also the fact that there's more shadow, that helps to indicate this and remind me along the way. Now the other thing I'm also considering is just the surface of the form that I'm rendering as well, because I need to make sure that these hatches follow along the curvature of its surface, if I want to get it to come across correctly. Once more, it's all about making sure that you're visually communicating these three-dimensional aspects of your design in an accurate way. And it can be very easy to completely miss the boat on that, in all honesty. It's not uh, it's something that requires practice, and you do need to make sure that you're dedicating yourself to your craft each and every single day, even if it means you're just starting out by shading basic spheres and cubes, as we talked about earlier, because really, in the end, the characteristics of that simplified geometry still applies here on the character that we're rendering up now. They may be more complex and they may be more intricate, but still those underlying principles and fundamentals apply here. And if you follow them, you're going to be pretty good to go. So now I'm just laying in some more line weights around his foot there, trying to accentuate and define the shape that little bit more. And then I move back to the hatching, shading now the smaller leg muscle groups within the lower leg here. And there's a lot of different muscle groups going on in this portion of the human anatomy. And I know Goliath probably isn't all that human looking, but for the most part, his muscle groups do somewhat mimic those of the average human being. He's just a lot bigger and more blown up. Um, so a lot of the time what I end up having up next to me during the shading process is some references just to help me make sure that I am shading all of these different muscle groups in the correct way. You know, it's not just thinking about the way in which they look in terms of shape and where they're placed throughout the body. You've also got to really have a solid idea as to what their surface is going to consist of. How far out does the form of each one of those muscles pop from the rest of the leg? Now, at the same time, as I am shading in each one of these individual muscles, now we're focused on the quads of the right-hand side leg here, at least as we're, as we're looking at Goliath. Um, what I also try to do is I like to think about the overall basic form of the leg itself. So the fundamental building block that I use to establish the foundations of Goliath right at the beginning. Because by converting his legs and really thinking about them as basic cylinders, very, very simplified shapes inside my mind, I'm able to capture that hierarchy of light as it hits the character and casts across it in a much more 
accurate way. So I'm always thinking about the macro and the micro forms that I'm dealing with whenever I'm shading, especially when I'm shading. The rendering process requires it, it demands it. And you need to always, on a constant basis, be aware of that as you're working because it's all too easy to put in the work and put hours and hours into really pushing the amount of detail that you're adding into your artwork and then find that all of it is just one indecipherable mess because you want your artwork to read properly. And if you're ever in doubt about that, all you got to do is squint your eyes in order to blur the details, blur the rendering, and just see the major shapes and the major tones and values that you are dealing with, that you're implementing into your drawing. And if you can't decipher the major aspects of your design after you start to squint and blur that image, that's when there's... A problem. That's when you really need to go back and rethink your approach. Maybe you need to do some erasing. Maybe you need to do some correcting. And oftentimes I do. I am certainly not uh, excluded from having to do that. Trial and error is just part of being a comic book artist. And a majority of my time is really bumping into obstacles and figuring out how to get past them. And honestly, that is part of the fun for me. If I never ran into any problems, if I was never challenged, I would be so bored. Because as I said, I'm always thinking about where this hatching needs to go. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm almost interpreting this illustration and its progression as one big puzzle that needs to be solved. Now, if I knew already exactly where that hatching needed to go and it was all automatic, which at some point it kind of feels like because, you know, you just get, you, you practice it so much that it really does become this automatic process that doesn't require a whole lot of conscious analysis. I'd, I'd just be bored. You know, I wouldn't really, I'd just have to spend the time that it took to get this guy rendered up. And without having to think about it, without any information for my brain to devour, without any puzzle to solve, I would find that very, very, very tedious. So uh, the other thing that, of course, inspires me and keeps me going throughout an illustration is watching it come together. You know, I mean, seeing Goliath and the way he looks with this rendering implemented into him and having those forms just begin to pop off of the page, seeing that with every single hatch I lay in, he gets more and more depth. It just, it inspires me. It, it really does. I start to look forward to the end product. And as I look forward to the end product, I'm very, very motivated to finish it, to get to that destination. Now here what you're seeing me lay in is a series of cross hatches on top of the initial layer of hatching that I added in before. Now as I already mentioned what this allows me to do is increase the contrast and to smooth out the blend of the tonal transitions that I created previously. And this is something which is going to only add more depth to your art. Some people leave it at just one layer of hatching and that's completely fine. You don't have to go to the trouble of adding in cross hatches because you're essentially doubling your workload by doing that. Now, as I said before, I do make mistakes and sometimes I don't like the direction at which I'm taking my artwork. And you can see that this was one of those situations where I just deleted a whole bunch of cross hatches that I had already added in because I just I didn't like what I saw on the page. And I'm picky. I'm a perfectionist. A lot of artists are. I wish that I wasn't. It's kind of a curse and a gift at the same time, but it does certainly hold me back from being as productive as I would otherwise be. If I just let some things go, if I let some things slide, I guess. But as I was saying, these cross hatches are 
really allow me to push the depth to a whole other level throughout my character. And what you'll notice is that now, instead of running along the form, they're actually wrapping around it on a different axis. In fact, they are now being placed in at a 90 degree angle to the hatches that were implemented before. And so that's why it's called hatching. That's why it's called cross hatching, because you're literally creating hatches on the page. And so I'm pulling each one of these cross hatches out of the shadows. And as I do, you'll notice that at the base of each cross hatch, I add a little bit more weight. I make them thicker at the bottom and thinner at the top. And I taper them off into the lighter portions of the form until they disappear. So I'm creating that gradient that I was able to create with the initial layer of hatching, but just in a different way. Now I'm tapering off the length of the line. And I did do that to some extent with the hatches that I laid in at the start. But now I'm creating a fade, a blend, a transitional tone between the light and dark values with a different approach, with a different technique. The initial hatches that I laid in, in order to have them fade off out of the shadow and into the highlight, well, I made them much thicker along their entire trajectory where they were closest to the shadow, and then I slowly but surely spread them further and further apart and made them thinner, again, along their trajectory until they had disappeared into the highlights. In fact, sometimes with the hatches, I'll just, I'll end up breaking them halfway in order to get that, that, grade, that gradual transition of tone from the darkest tones that we're dealing with in the shadowed areas of Goliath's body and then having them transition into the, the lighter areas, have them break up, get thinner, get fainter, subtler until they, again, just evaporate into those lighter sections. And I'm going to go throughout Goliath's entire body again. I'm adding in another layer of hatching here, and it's going to take me just as long. You can see that for the most part, what makes the cross hatches just a little bit easier is they are much shorter in length. Uh, we are still able to control their gradient through the distance at which we're placing them and, and of course, their length and their thickness. But uh, this time around, because we are pulling them out around the form instead of along the length of the form, we just don't have to draw them out as far. In fact, we only, or I tend to only draw them out as far as I've faded off the underlying layer of hatches into those highlights. And I think that's why I pull that layer of hatches out at the start along the form instead of around it, because it shows me exactly where that gradient should end before there's completely just white value until the the form really transitions into a completely bright portion on its surface where the light is hitting it at its most intense. And once more, I'm thinking about the curvature of the surface that I'm drawing these cross hatches out around. And I want to always be conscious of that because just as with those underlying hatches, as we pulled them out along the form on the on a completely different axes, we want to also describe it now on the new axes that we're pulling it out around. And this is what adds to that additional level of three-dimensionality within the character. It's something that is extremely useful to have, not always desired by the artist or even the reader. This is a particular style that I am very fond of, but 
a lot of people tend to prefer that simpler, more stylized look within their comic book art. And that is completely fine. I can get around that. I understand exactly why people prefer it. It's less visually busy. It's easier to interpret. It hits you and you're able to understand what you're seeing almost instantly. Whereas with something that is a little bit more detailed, such as this, with a higher level of visual complexity incorporated within it, it's going to take the viewer just a little bit more time to sit there and fully take it in. And that's kind of what I want. That's what I'm aiming for with my artwork. I want the viewer to spend some time looking at my art. I really want them to just just take it in and and look at all those itty bitty details. I want them to notice something different, something new every time they sit down and look at my art. And I think that that's something which is is absolutely wonderful because the more time that someone spends with your art, the more it's going to stay with them. At least in my opinion, it won't be passive they will be a little bit more engaged, a little bit more immersed. Not to mention the fact that when you have enhanced the three-dimensionality of your two-dimensional artwork, it's going to leave much more of a visual impact on the audience. It's going to pop right off of the page. People are going to notice it, especially if it's done well. Now, in order to do it well, once more, it's all about making sure that this hatching, the shading that you're adding into your character, the shadows, the highlights, that everything is balanced according to the hierarchy of light fall off that the major light source is projecting out across your character. And then thinking about those major forms as well, because if you kind of break it down and you look at Goliath's upper body, around his chest area, you can see that that that, br that massive portion of his upper torso is kind of bent over the midsection. And since the major light source is projecting down onto the top of the character from the left, the result of that is going to be a cast shadow which will occur around the abdominal section. And that's the reason as to why we are seeing more shadow occur around that area, why we're going to see an increased density of hatches. Now, the other thing that I want to mention here, and I think it's very, very important, is exactly what tweaking the variables within your hatches is going to allow you to do. So remember, there's three of them. There's the thickness of your hatches, the distance at which they're sitting from one another, and their length. Now also their shape can come into it as well. Again, whether or not they're straight hatches or whether they're curving around those forms, we already kind of mentioned that that is ultimately going to be down to the surface characteristics of the asset that you're dealing with within your character. But for now, let's focus on those characteristics, those variables within the hatches and how you can control them to get the effect that you're after. Now, in order to create a darker, denser tone, what you'll want to do is you'll want to cluster your hatches very closely together and for even more of a darker value to occur, you'll also want to increase their thickness. So super thick hatches, well, maybe not super thick, but thickened hatches with a heavier weight that are squashed together, that are close together, that have a very minimal amount of distance between them will result in a darker tone. Now, if you want to transition into a lighter tone, then what you'll want to do is the opposite to that. You want to pull those hatches apart, spread them further, and make them less thick. You want to thin them out a little bit, make them finer. And you can do this to such an extent that eventually those lines become so fine that they disappear into the highlights. They are barely visible. And between the darkest values and the lightest values that you're creating within the tones 
that have been suggested by your hatching, you'll be able to scale the light and darkness within those tones to whatever the desired effect that you're trying to go for is. Okay, so again, when you're dealing with a large form, that requires quite a large spread, a big blend, a gradient between the deepest darks and the brightest highlights, then you will want to slowly but surely start thick and close together for your hatches and then bit by bit spread them apart, make them a little bit lighter. And then as you get further and further into the lighter portions of your form, make them even lighter again, spread them further apart and keep on doing this. Keep on pushing your hatches apart and making them finer until you can barely see them on the page. And by that point, you would have hopefully created a mid-tone between your shadows and highlights that, uh, that fairly well blends those two dark and light values together. But here's the other thing that you have to also consider, and that is the width of your blend. Depending on the form that you're dealing with, you'll either want to keep that narrow or you'll want to make it wide. It is completely up to you. Now, when it comes to muscles, the blend between the shadows and the highlights can be wide, but they can also be fairly short. They can also uh, split off from the shadows into the high well, highlights quite starkly, quite quickly. So you've got to think about the muscle that you're dealing with. There's a lot more to anatomy, as I said, than knowing where the muscles go, how big they need to be, and, and, uh, and also their shape. You've also got to understand the form of the muscle itself in order to be able to shade it effectively. There is a certain softness to muscles, but they can also be extremely defined. You know, if you think about a ripped bodybuilder, well, you're dealing with some very sharp transitions between the forms. The, the muscle groups are split up definitively, and you can really see each and every one of them uh, on a, an extremely fit athlete. And so when it comes to your comic book characters, where most of the time that's exactly what you're trying to present within your comic book art is a muscular, very fit, extremely capable character, then you're going to want to give their muscles that additional definition. You're going to want to know exactly where you need to split those muscles off from one another and how deep those divisions are going to be and then where they're going to blend together a little bit. Now, this distinction between the muscles is going to get more obvious within the darker portions of your character. You can see that there is more of a split between the major muscle groups within the darker areas of Goliath's body here around the bottom of his legs, for example, or around the abdominal region. And the reason for that is because these areas simply have more shadow. They are catching less light. Whereas up the top, we still have a little bit of definition within the muscles, but less of a division between them because the light is hitting the major portion of the leg, of the arm, and the neck and the chest directly. And so you will still get a little bit of a split between the major muscle groups that reside within those areas, but you'll also see that they somewhat merge into one another at the brightest points of that larger overall form that they're encompassing, that they're abiding by. And so you always have to remember that when you're shading the individual subforms, which are the muscle groups in this case of the major forms throughout your character, that those subforms are going to be shaded within the context of the major forms and how the light is hitting them first and foremost. And if you can keep 
both of those things in mind, not just the subform that you're dealing with, but the major form as well, then you should end up with a character that is shaded pretty accurately, but more important, a character that is readable from a distance. Like, for example, if you look up here to the right hand side of the interface in Clip Studio Paint, you'll see the navigator panel. And you'll notice that from a distance, even though we're very zoomed out and you're looking at an extremely um, long distance perspective view of Goliath in that panel there, that he still reads. You can still understand what is going on. Now, just while we've got our attention up here in the navigator panel, you'll notice that just underneath it, we have the zoom function. And you'll notice that I'm working at a distance of about 25%. And this is really important to note because what you're seeing me demonstrate here on the screen in front of you is exactly what I'm seeing when I'm illustrating. Yeah, that's it. A lot of people think when they watch these comic art demonstrations that I put out, they think that I'm working closer than I actually am. And they wonder, well, how did you manage to record this demonstration at a distance while implementing this level of detail? And they just assume that I must have been really working in close to get all these itty bitty details incorporated into the illustration. But that's not the case at all. I work from this distance. And to tell you the truth, I have to, because if I worked any closer, my characters would be totally over-rendered. They would be totally over-detailed. And by the time I zoomed back out and actually printed this illustration at the scale it was meant for, so let's say a, a standard comic book page size, well, those details just wouldn't read. You wouldn't be able to tell what's going on. They would blur into one... It'd be like blurring your eyes, right? Like, sure, the artwork would still read, but those hatches individually just wouldn't be able to be visually made out. So I have to work from a bit of a distance. Some people, in order to get this level of detail, need to work in super close. And so the distance at which you work will be relevant to the amount of detail that you like to incorporate into your illustrations and also that you're comfortable incorporating into your illustrations because it depends what distance you like working at. I think that this works for me and it feels very, very comfortable. I dig it. It's fantastic. But you know, for you, it might, it might be just impossible to be able to interpret the shading and the way in which those muscles need to come across from this distance. You might need to get in a little bit closer. The advantage to working from a bit of a distance, by the way, yet still being able to implement this level of detail, is that you're able to get that overall view as to how all of this shading, all of this cross-hatching, and the details, the shadows, literally every single aspect of this character that I'm adding in is going to come together as a whole. I can see him in full as I'm working on each of the individual portions of the character. That's very, very important to me because one trap that I have fallen into in the past is when I'm working too close, not only do I spend forever completing that illustration, implementing copious amounts of detail that I probably don't need to, but then what makes it worse is then when I zoom out, nothing is to scale. The density of rendering on the character's head is displaced from the amount of rendering that I've added into the rest of the body. Or maybe it's just an individual arm that has more rendering than the other, and it just doesn't quite make sense because I wasn't able to compare how one section of the body that I was illustrating looks in comparison to another section. And everything needs to pull together at the end. It needs to fit together cohesively. If it doesn't, then the whole illustration is just going to fall apart and not make any visual sense whatsoever. So these are the things that always need to be considered. It's why I love being a comic book artist. It's constantly challenging, and it's something that keeps me on my toes on a daily basis.
I like to be challenged as an artist. That's why I'm still in the comic art game. If I wasn't challenged, then I'd, I'd probably lose interest. It's usually not until I conquer something that I end up getting over it. You know, but while I'm trying to figure it out, while I'm trying to work it, uh, that's when I'm most involved. That's when I'm at my highest level of engagement. Now, the fact that you're able to get to such a level where you can create the kind of artwork that you always dreamt to create, dreamt of creating, I guess, uh, that's inspiring. And that does pump me up each and every day. Like, I love the way that Goliath turned out in this instance. I can't say that about all my artwork. There are some duds, of course, but there are also some pieces of art, some character designs that I'm extremely proud of. And, you know, you learn from the duds. <laughs> the ones that don't work out, they they really do help you to understand where you went wrong and to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes in the future. And then when it comes to a character such as this, you're able to take on board all take on board all the knowledge that you took away from the duds, the artworks that didn't work out and create something that you are truly impressed by. All right, so now we've pretty much done the shading for the most part. All of that hatching has been placed in, and it's looking pretty darn good. But now it's time for the finishing touches. What you can see me adding in here is a few nicks and scratches, some little tiny details throughout Goliath's body to emphasize the surface of those forms, of course, but also the texture and material that his body is made of. But that pretty much wraps up this demonstration. I hope that you got a ton of value out of it and that you will try out some of the cross hatching and rendering techniques that we went over in this tutorial. Thanks so much for watching. If you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. Over on the site, you'll find a bunch of written tutorials, videos, a podcast, and when you're ready to take your comic art skill set to the next level, you can also check out our range of courses in the How to Draw Comic Store. There's something for everybody there, and if you do have a sticking point within your art that you just can't get past, it's very likely that the solution to your problem is sitting there waiting for you in our course selection. We have some very talented instructors that we brought on board just waiting to help you out. So be sure to check it out, and until next time, keep on creating, Keep on drawing and practicing, and I'll see you in the next lesson.